point. Phenomenon of Svetlana Tikhanovskaya. Svetlana Tikhanovskaya, who has been nominated to a Nobel Peace Award uh, this year. And the Belarusians uh, look forward so much uh, for uh, in these directions. Phenomenon of, of Tikhanovskaya is a phenomenon of democracy, largely speaking. Uh, it's it's an opportunity uh, democracy gives to people to uh, uh, elect as a leader someone who does not belong to the inner cycles of uh, of power. Uh, a person like Tikhanovskaya, a housewife, in fact, uh, could not be, could not have the, uh, would not have chances to be elected as leader of uh, China, Russia, or Saudi Arabia. But here in Belarus, suddenly a housewife and ordinary people, average people, someone who was not in, 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 in the politics uh, before, suddenly became a, an icon, a symbol. And it was very powerful to see it. And I think that it would be very, very inspirational to... It was a purely Hollywoodian story, story of Svetlana Tikhanovska. I am sure Hollywood will make um, several movies about it. And I am sure that it will inspire people in different countries. I can do. Yes, we can. We can do something if we are. And the phenomenon of Tikhanovskaya, of course, would not be uh, would not be possible without the support of people, of friends around her, of uh, Maria Kalesnikova, who is imprisoned now, who is jailed in Belarus, of uh, Veronika Tsepkala, wife of uh, another presidential candidate, without the support of uh, uh, thousands of women in, here inside the country who went to the streets with flowers uh, after the election to stop the violence, and they managed to stop this violence. It was also very inspiration. Uh, uh, next point, uh, media and uh, telegram, media and telegram. The evolution of media, which could take years, happened here in a month period here. Traditional media had to go uh, to messengers, and uh, all these events which uh, take took place in Belarus would not be possible without Telegram. Telegram was uh, the the key, the key, the, the the core of this revolution. Authorities could not block this messenger. They they could block Telegram only to blocking uh, total internet access, while they could not afford it, as infrastructure would fail. So Telegram is a is a great great phenomenal. Uh, what else? Uh, um, what other? What can other countries do? Uh, politically, uh, politically, the investigations of killings and torture cases uh, are uh, very important uh, here. Uh, now, uh, we cannot do it inside the country, but uh, it is very important that such investigations. Uh, Lithuania has already started one. Uh, take place in other countries. On the human side, it's very important simply to help people travel. Uh, help people travel. I uh, would like to remind you, uh, maybe uh, you do not know this, but Svetlana Tikhanovskaya, as a child, traveled to Ireland, as a child of Chernobyl. Uh, many countries in Belarus and Ireland was among them, accepted, uh, hosted uh, thousands of uh, children from regions affected by a Chernobyl disaster. And I think that this experience of traveling to Europe as a child was uh, uh, very formative for Svetlana Tikhanovskaya. And the third thing, uh, so for, polit for politicians, for lawyers, it's very important to make investigations of tortures because they are unbearable and unacceptable. Uh, hundreds of people have been tortured here in, in the center of Europe, something um, terrible that we lived through that personally me, uh, you know, that uh, you, un you you go to bed and you understand that tomorrow, uh, this night, you can be taken out of your home and you may be taken to jail where you will be tortured. It's um, terrible. Um, for people, help Belarusian travel. And for intellectual, for intellectuals, what can intellectuals, what can, what can academics do? Uh, please translate from Belarusian. Please translate Belarusians from Rus the Russian language. Please have our voices be heard in your countries. These are my uh, starting points.
Rick, you need to unmute yourself if you want. Yeah, I just, I just done so. In fact, I want to ask: Did, did you want to continue uh, with any questions at this point? Right. No, I, I, I would propose because Alexandra, Alexandra has quite a short uh, intro. If uh, in uh, in reply to what Andre has said, would you like to add something to Andre or comment on Andre's points, Alexandra? Uh, yeah, I want to first of all to thank Andre, who made a wonderful introduction and also really draw a very good picture, I think, of what's currently going on. Uh, whilst he touched upon the topic of what can be done internationally and locally, obviously this international, whatever happening on the international scene, is really a very important instrument of pressure. Because now, when it comes to this, getting to this point of negotiations, our like main instrument is to put a pressure on this regime. And obviously, whatever is going on in the international scene is a huge step toward this uh, goal. And obviously, this, as I mentioned before, this meetings with the leaders was a huge step, but also any kind of sanctions or uh, international support, making this visible is really helpful tool and instrument is really getting us closer. And also, it's incredibly powerful uh, factor for the people who are still in Belarus to see this kind of solidarity, especially now, is kind of a little bit of the low season now. Not only the temperature and the mood also is uh, not that optimistic or stable that it used to be. This kind of international solidarity is increasingly important and it's really a tool to show but also to provide a real support for the people on the ground. And I would also just follow and Andre encourage everyone to to be part of that. And this kind of discussion is also incredibly useful. And thank you again for showing this kind of solidarity with us. And this is this may appear small, but actually every single step, every single move like that is incredibly helpful and important. Rick, you have some questions. Uh, yes, I mean, we will move to um, the audience, but uh, I mean, th this has been extremely informative. For all of us, um, we all know that we work in a very crowded world of international affairs, and there are very many competing interests. And this is, I think, something of a tragedy, something of a difficulty for us. And as I suggested at the beginning, Belarus is a country that I certainly know and consider to be very European, and where I think there is enormous willingness and desire to see tremendous change and to support the initiatives that have been done there. Uh, I'm wondering how we can try to do still more when there are so many other issues that distract from us. Um, and I wonder also, and perhaps this is a question uh, to each of you, what what do you do in order to build up the resources that you're speaking of? That you talk about the support that you you get and that you need to keep your initiatives working. Are you able to tell us a little bit more where you are able to derive those? And then perhaps a bit more specifically, what the international community can do. I mean, we could, uh, as Andre suggests, you know, translate and transmit information, but we, we have an uphill struggle against so many competing factors mm -hmm. in in international media. So thank you. Yeah, thank you, Rick, for the question. Uh, surely the key instrument in building resources on the our side and the side of civil society is actually to form the organized structure I think that Andre briefly mentioned it before, and then I think it was widely covered in the international press that the character of the protest and also what made it strong in the beginning was that it was completely, uh, it was decentered and it was pretty sporadic. And that was also one of the factors why it also occurred and it was a huge factor of success. But now we have to move forward and it means that we have to structure that all those initiatives, amazing uh, civil society, this uh, this dvari, like this yard communities uh, and these social groups of students, workers, factory workers, medical workers, you name it, that now they have to build structures and that's the way how we call also can increase resources because we need to move for towards this organizational and structuring and that would help to accumulate power and to regroup and also to plan better how we can now do not the individual steps, let's say, if someone is making a campaign to uh, to quit the state workers union, for instance, because that, this will drain the state resources, because I don't know if you know, because this is also one of the campaign we try to push forward, because this uh, almost everyone like the 
the huge amount of people who are state dependent on state dependent jobs, they are kind of almost forced to be in the state working union. And this means that they pay for being a part of this union. And this is a huge financial resource for the state. So we we kind of part of the campaign is to encourage people to leave this uh, official state unions. And if this happens only with one group of people, OK, there will be something, but th this will not be reach the desired results. So we need to have this organized structures with whom we can communicate and then to have this like a massive move so that everybody's quitting this uh, state working union, just to give you an example. And also this is like the same goes for international scene. Uh, really an enormous work has been done by the Belarusian diaspora worldwide. They really showed up in tremendous ways and they supported us in all different directions. In one of these uh, tool or what they are doing, for instance, uh, they can they have instruments and enough resources to put pressure internationally. For instance, for the companies who are working with our state factories, like the biggest one, like Belkali, for instance. Uh, and this is I think this is what the best covered case with Yara, who is a Norwegian provider, who is a Norwegian buyer of this uh, potash production from the Belarusian factory. So what diaspora did, they actually they kept this pressure going. They sent they sent letters, they occupied completely the Twitter and social media. They actually when there was still no lockdown, they mean this they made these public events in uh, like uh, in front of the HQs of the factory. And that's what also can be done. But it also is only possible once we have the structures where we can communicate clearly the messages to the specific groups and then reach together the desired results. Okay. Thank you very much. I think we probably will move to uh, any audience questions, but if I could just um, ask another, and again, this could be to both of you, but it's particularly picking up from a point that uh, Andre had made, and uh, it comes in perhaps one single word, and that is Russia. Uh, Belarus, uh, in many ways, has been very deeply uh, involved, even integrated with Russia. And perhaps it could be me who says that uh, the Kremlin has an extremely strong allergetic reaction to any democratic impulses in surrounding countries. Um, could we uh, discuss how we see a possible Russian hand? And when we when we heard the word possible intervention, what can we say what might be the tipping point? Because there have been mass protests for such a long time. Uh, the regime is possibly getting weaker. At what point would we conceive of a, of a possible intervention and what would it look like? And that particularly, I presume, on the basis that the security services in Belarus have extremely strong uh, ties elsewhere. May I answer? Uh, Russia. Uh, Russia is key to Belarus. Uh, Belarus now structurally uh, can be compared to Eastern European satellites of the Soviet Union in 70s and 80s. It's a sovereign country, but its sovereignty is very limited so far. And uh, what happened in Belarus this year can be compared to what happened in Poland during uh, in um, 1980. It's a moment of solidarity in Belarus. Of course, very different uh, with Belarusian uh, specificity, with uh, online specificity. Uh, the, the, the OPEC is different, but it, it was an, uh, an outburst of solidarity, first of all. In Poland, solidarity was a very powerful moment, but uh, uh, Poland had to wait until the Soviet Union collapses, until uh, the Soviet Union weakens uh, before uh, liberating. And I uh, wonder whether Belarus is able to do it before Russia before the next moment of Russia and uh, Russia weakness. Maybe we will be able, or maybe we will not be able. What is sure that uh, Belarus, unlike many other countries, will uh, not be able to become a Russian enemy. 
the best variant, the best option we can expect is the option of Finlandization of Belarus. Uh, for the moment, we uh, understand clearly that uh, we will be, uh, we will need to be very careful with Russia, very careful because we are too close to Moscow. Uh, Orsha and Vitebsk are only 400 kilometers from Moscow, so uh, of course we are geostrategically important to Moscow, and we understand it. This uh, this is about Russia, but Russia was uh, far from be. Uh, First point that during the election, the first days after the election, Russia, the Russia, the position of Moscow was uh, very ambiguous until the uh, Lukashenko's phone call to Putin on uh, the first Saturday, six days after the election, well into the protest in the country. The rhetoric of Russian official media was ambiguous. Uh, we, we can, we do not know why. Maybe they could, uh, they wanted to provoke something in Belarus to interfere later. We cannot uh, exclude this variant. But uh, the, 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 the rhetoric was not ambiguous, and they um, wrote neutrally about Tsikhanovsky. It was until the Lukashenko phone call to, to to Putin, and maybe some promises made made to Putin uh, to Putin after. Okay. Uh, in a moment, we'll we'll go to the public's questions. But after asking uh, a question uh, 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 regarding international ramifications of the Belarusian situation, I would like uh, to turn the attention of our speakers and listeners uh, to the situ to the domestic situation, especially something which is not very well realized uh, outside uh, Belarus, uh, that uh, the standoff nowadays between the regime and uh, the popular will of the public uh, and of the protesters in the streets uh, are uh, national symbols uh, of Belarus, uh, like uh, the uh, white, uh, uh, red uh, and white uh, tricolor, which is uh, displayed be at, uh, at uh, Andrei Dinko's uh, uh, stream. And recently, meaning last week uh, or the last two weeks, uh, quite worryingly, uh, you know, kind of uh, collapse uh, to by the police or by the security forces uh, uh, on Belarusian language uh, leading publishers. Uh, in, in in Belarus, who are the last publishers actually publishing uh, books in Belarusian. Um, could, could you comment on this uh, literally cultural war of the regime uh, on uh, the Belarusian national symbols uh, and language? Uh. Indeed, uh, the regime is based on uh, Soviet values. Uh, the regime is based on values which are uh, uh, which are shared by post-Soviet dictatorships in Russia, in Kazakhstan, in Belarus. While uh, the opposition movement uh, shares. Uh, commits itself to uh, what is called here, maybe wrongly, maybe a bit uh, in, in, in illusion way, uh, European values. So this conflict between European values and a Soviet heritage is uh, very present here. And for Lukashenko, uh, the uh, the national, Belarusian national value, the European uh, values is uh, an anathema, a taboo. And uh, he persecutes now uh, the publishers, uh, of course not uh, because they publish in the Belarusian language, uh, the state publishing houses publishes in the Belarusian language, but it persecutes uh, these publishers for publishing uh, products, uh, books, uh, which uh, uh, are not liked by the regime. Uh, persecute them for publishing George Orwell in 1984, because it uh, reminds too much of the situation inside the country. Uh, may I add to this, Thomas, if Andrei, you are finished, right? Yeah, yeah. 
please. Yeah, just a few words, because I think that what is important to understand is that what you've called this uh, cultural war is not just what happened this year only. I think that Andrei would also uh, confirm that this is what the regime has been doing over the last at least 20 years. I also happen to know the situation of this how in this independent publishing world because uh, my father owns one of the uh, few this independent publishing houses uh, which has been persecuted over the last 10 years with the evoking the license, the finance, the bookstore. And that's also every single writer who is currently writing in Belarusian and is not a part a member of the state uh, writers union will tell you that they every single one of them has faced certain type of persecutions since the late 90s. So this is just a consistent uh, struggle and war against uh, anything that could put in question the values, the values that Andre mentioned about, that anything that could contradict or put in question or offer the alternative to what the regime is trying to impose or the ideology on whatever level it is, even on this intellectual or cultural level. And this is the prohibition of the white, red, white is just the extreme and absurdist uh, sign of that. Uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, and th that's how I read it. Obviously, we would like we wanted to hear it from you. And uh, I, I was most surprised that Knihas uh, a, a grassroots uh, publisher, which published 500 volumes of Belarusian uh, literature, basically, uh, they are also persecuted. They are not publishing any Orwell, 1984, but they are, uh, but they are still being uh, persecuted for publishing Belarusian language literature, which is uh, beyond strange, but probably uh, the norm. Uh, at, at this point, I guess we should turn to the public's uh, uh, questions, uh, and uh, our colleague Kurt Basiner will be asking the questions. All right. Well, um, thank you very much for, uh, for for sending your questions by chat. Continue to do that. Uh, I my connection with Belarus very briefly was I was an election observer for for Odir in two thousand one, uh, operating out of Vitebsk, so the rayons east toward the Russian border. Um, and of course, what immediately followed that was nine eleven, which meant that the international attention to the very blatantly stolen, beautiful and elegant election that Lukashenko called was was scuppered by by other events, as Rick alluded to. So this question comes from Josef Robert Bivowetz or Bivowetz. Uh, sorry if I've mispronounced your name. Uh, should the EU not be doing more for the Belarusian people by offering membership? Should the people call for it? They've never formally offered membership, nor has Belarus asked for it. EU enlargement in 1991 accepted many members who did not meet the Copenhagen criteria for various reasons because geopolitics were more important. Uh, why can this same rationale not be used? Um, and I think the second part of the question about the geopolitics uh, influ we've already covered, but how does that influence the offer of membership? Uh, so to both the, our panelists, uh, uh, whoever wants to start first on that question, please feel free. Well, I will give the word to Andrei and then follow with the answer. Okay. Mm. Of course, an offer of uh, EU membership would inspire people here and would increase the pure pro-European uh, pro uh, uh, wing of the society. But uh, on the other uh, side, uh, we must be realist and realistically uh, thinking, we must go step by step. Today it is uh, uh, impossible. Okay, today it is impossible. Uh, but uh, I think that first maybe Europe someday offers um, the perspective of European EU membership to Ukraine. And then Belarus will follow. Belarus has often followed Ukraine historically. Uh, it may happen also this time. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. Yeah, thank you, Dave. I would follow by actually uh, shifting a little bit the uh, the focus of this question. I would like to stress again and again, as Svetlana mentioned in every speech, what's happening now is the crisis or this the the uh, revolution has no geopolitical agenda. It means the people on the streets are not there for being a members of the EU or being part of the Russia, and this is really 
crucially important to maintain this wherever we are discussing the international politics, that for Belarus it's important to remain a sovereign country. Would it be nice? Maybe it will at some point come to this negotiation. But again, this is a question not to our side. If we ask if the EU can offer the membership, this is the question to the EU Council. And that's uh, unfortunately neither of us can address this question. Okay. I'm, I'm wondering, could I be impertinent and make a couple of comments to Josef's question as well? Um, would, that be, would that be okay with everybody? Um, it's a very pertinent question. Um, I, I would just suggest first that Belarus is the only country in Europe that is not a member of the Council of Europe. There are 47 other members, Belarus is not. Uh, I think if there were um, a political change in Belarus, this is one of the ways that it would be embraced immediately. And membership of the Council of Europe, I mean, when we think back to the early 1990s, as Josef is suggesting in that question, the Council of Europe was the antechamber to becoming an EU member state. You had to become Council of Europe first. And Council of Europe is about real democracy, about rule of law, about real protection for human rights. It's, it's a stamp of international approval of legal and judicial protection. So I would think Belarus would want to aim for that first. Uh, they'd have to get rid of the death penalty, incidentally. But that would be one, one, I think, tangible way of showing immense progress and of aiding further progress. And to that also, we shouldn't forget that there is the Eastern Partnership. That's six post-Soviet countries, a fairly ramshackle collection I mean, very, very disparate countries, but the EU put them all together. But what's important there is that post-communist countries, the Baltic states, the Visegrad states, are very active within the EAP. And they have taken on for themselves, I think, in the EU, a role of advocating for and tangibly supporting post-Soviet countries, uh, Belarus and Ukraine. So there are other ways that we could meet some of these things. I think EU membership, for many reasons, would be a long-term prospect. But there are many very valuable, I think, interim measures that could be taken. So, thank you. Okay, the, the next question we've received from the audience is from Alistair Merrill. And following on from Rick's comments, Russian intervention, direct or otherwise, in Belarus would have clear implications for the Baltic states. Is there a risk that Moscow will see this as an opportunity to destabilize them? Of course it is. <laughs> I mean, that's obviously the, inter well, the intervention we have, understand, yes, it's a very powerful propaganda tool. If it's a real threat, it's a huge question. And also Russia understands it better than the other, that this, first of all, obviously will immediately trigger the international crisis, the one we haven't seen in years. And also when we're talking about this possible, probable, theoretical Russian intervention, it's also quite clear for Russia that, and at least the sociological questionnaire in Belarus shows that even those who have the, they're not for Russia, but sympathetic with Russia, this will immediately uh, lose this, even this audience, because any kind of this very aggressive intervention style movements from Russia will turn every second Belarusians, even those who are not involved in the current uh, oppositional activities against Russia. This will definitely will be seen by the majority of the population as extreme aggression, and they will lose even those supporters whom they might possibly have nowadays in the country. Kurt, your microphone is off. We cannot hear you. Discovered this. Yes, sorry. Andre, would you like to add to this, please? I think that uh, the last year, La uh, Moscow saw clearly that Belarus is not Russia anymore. The event of the last year showed that Russia, uh, that Belarus is not more a part of the Russian world. And this is very, very important. And this will influence the political thinking of uh, Russian politicians. And I hope also of uh, uh, the thinking of politicians in Western European countries as well. Okay, thank you. Um, our next question is from Katarina Barbi, and she said, why do you think this is happening now? Uh, Dr. Ginto mentioned Telegram and the charisma of the president-elect. Are there other factors that set these elections apart from two of the pre from the previous ones that have also been stolen? Well, I think Andre partially answered this question in the beginning. 
uh, which mentioned the uh, like the COVID crisis and then complete mismanagement of the situation by the government. Um, and that's uh, kind of the variety of factors. Also, I think what was not mentioned, sorry, Andre, I, I, I misheard that, but also the also the way the government handled the all the uh, people who were regi- who wanted to be the who ran for the candidacy, and the way they were handled also were so blatantly, uh, you know, uh, demotivating for the part of the audience that all of these people went to prison even before getting a chance to be registered, and it, and as well like the third and absolutely uh, important factor in this uh, the surge of violence. Maybe, maybe if they on the night of August, if the government did not impose this increase, if they didn't let loose the Amon and the this uh, Siloviki, and there was not such a surge of violence, maybe the situation would be different now. But this is actually what triggered the 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 absolute those people who were not involved in any kind of, uh, let's say, protesting activities before. I'm sure Andre would like to add as well. Please do. Uh, what happened in Belarus was a, uh, in uh, in fact, a classical landslide election. It was a, like an avalanche. You know, you have snow and snow and snow and snow, and suddenly you have an avalanche. And we had this landslide. It was stalking and stalking and stalking for years. Different thing, economic thing, political things. It was also the change of habits, the internet revolution. Before this, Lukashenko controlled uh, radio and television and he controlled minds. But now with the internet, he, he, he cannot. Well, if I might be, uh, I'd like to ask Alexandra a question, but it, and it is, for, of course, to ask Andre to comment. I mean, you, when you talked about resources, I'm reminded of this sort of so, it immediately sounded like you're following principles of of strategic nonviolent conflict and sort of weighing your assets Absolutely. versus. And I'd, I'd be curious to to draw you out a little bit further on that on how this is informing your strategic thinking, uh, and and assets. If you could weigh in on the assets other than uh, coercive fat power that you see uh, still on that side of the ledger, on the Lukashenko side of the ledger, where where external actors can weigh in and perhaps be most helpful. Yeah, you, you've dealt with some of this in, in your previous answers, but if you wanted to elaborate a little further, that would be great. Uh, yes, Kurt, thank you for pointing this out. Yes, I should have actually started with this. This is non-violent resistance is a core and solid principle of our strategy. And we keep talking this and there they could be no talk of any kind of escalation or uh, of the conflict. This is the this is what makes it uh, successful so far, and that's the only way we can uh, win if we maintain this non-violent resistant process. And um, uh, sorry, I might have misheard this second part of the. What would the, what would you like to be elaborated on? I, I was just curious is 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 where where you see the balance sheet uh, in terms of of the assets the assets that the regime holds. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and they still maintain a, a strategic advantage. I know coercive power is obviously one mm-hmm. of them, but where where external actors uh, might be most helpful in targeting those assets? Um, what do you mean by external actors? Like the international uh, community? I mean I mean people like us who might be listening to us. Uh, mm-hmm. People people like like Stephen who, who who could talk to colleagues in the House of Commons. Those sorts of people. What kind of legislative executive action? Uh, should external actors do to demonstrate solidarity and help tip the balance in your favor to get the the dialogue that you you and 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 the president elect have been trying to to initiate with the government? Mm-hmm. I see. So the two points where the government still has maybe a bit or at least they have advantage is the financial resources because still there are so many ways the people even the uh, the citizens actually maintain financially the government without realizing this one of the examples i gave before is the state unions but there are hundreds other way where people actually financially support the system and they and we do a lot of campaigning and that's our goal actually to make people aware every single step of the way where they support financially the system and to drain this support will be actually uh, 
very helpful tool. We also know that the economically, the, the it's a question of few months before the economy collapses again, because it is already uh, leaving from the uh, from the credits, and that's not gonna uh, well stay long like this. And the other is obviously the human resources in terms of, for instance, we have this huge, tremendous nomenclature apparatus and we have to work a lot with these people. So at least uh, if they don't join us openly, that they maintain kind of solidarity by doing these Italian strikes or at least signaling their support by giving the information or at least showing us the sign that they are not with the, the current government they are working in. Uh, what concerns is international the, was the external actors. Certain legislative steps could be done. For instance, now there is this uh, the ongoing process of, for instance, for acknowledging Amon and Gubopik and all these syllabic organizations as terrorist ones. And this can only be done with the help of international organizations. And on the we know that every there is no let's say sustained or unique procedure for every country. So what could be done is that for every government, every country to find out these ways and solutions and also to lobby this question that every government actually kind of solicit this uh, acknowledgement of these terrorist organizations. Uh, also, this is more a question for the European Union, obviously, but the sanction list work tremendously. Actually, this carries a hell out of these people who are working for the government. And even the simple travel bans, as we heard recently, is actually a tremendous push factor and the pressure factor for those especially involved in these, uh, the, uh, the law enforcement people, this is also working and this is what the international community can, can, can do. And as Andre mentioned, obviously, like the just making Belarusian case present on literally on this news level or uh, on this liter more high literature level that this, the agenda is not a miss from the, from the from the media and or the cultural landscape. Thank you very much. That's that's very that fleshes it out a lot. Uh, Andre, would you like to add to that? Maybe only one thing. When it is about the struggle for democracy in a country like Belarus. Resources can do relatively little, while people's sacrifice is much more important. If we make some parallels with the situation in Russia, that uh, maybe I do not know what kind of resources can be invested uh, more in democracy in Russia. But the sacrifice of Alexei Navalny, who returned to Russia, returned to jail, to be jailed, is the most important factor which can change minds of, uh, of Russian people. So uh, here in Belarus, um, we, must, uh, we must understand that uh, the future of Belarus will be decided inside the country. However, it's important that uh, the immigration centers uh, continue what they do, but uh, we must also understand that uh, the, the future is here inside. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from um, first initial I, uh, Dor Drobish, saying, what lines, if any, would you draw between Belarus and Ukraine's 2004-2013-14 revolutions? What neighboring countries or institutions does your team expect to assist in helping spread the word about Belarus. Thank you. Well, I think I partially answered the question when I mentioned that it's not a, it has no geopolitical agenda. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Andre, would you like to add to that in, in any way in terms of the, the, the disposition of neighbors and what they could do to help? I think a lot of this has been sort of covered, but I did not understand the question. To tell the truth, uh, exactly. I think the 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 question is what 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 was was there any inspiration drawn from say the Orange Revolution or the Revolution of Dignity in Ukraine? I mean, I was I was in the former of those. I was I was an Odier uh, staff on the in in Ukraine in two thousand four. 
uh, and I saw a lot of Belarusian tricolors on the Maidan, for instance. So solidarity has been visible for a very long time. Uh, it was it was the second most common flag uh, in in addition to the Ukrainian one, uh, from my personal experience. So I'm I'm curious, uh, how much did that sort of shape thinking in terms of tactics, for example, or what things you didn't want to do that Ukrainians did, for example? I'm just I'm, I'm expanding on the gentleman's question, but uh, or, uh, but I wanted to see if uh, you had any reactions to that. Yes, indeed. And uh, the, a Belarusian guy, uh, Mikhail Zhiznevsky, was the second one to be killed in Kiev during the Maidan. It was a clear uh, demonstration of uh, where Belarusians were during these events. Uh, Belarusians cannot could not, I cannot repeat uh, the uh, the Maidan events because this, the, the internal situation in the country is very different. Uh, Belarus is a, uh, in Ukraine you had a corrupted, uh, corrupted uh, Yanukovych, uh, Yanukovych semi-democratic regime, uh, while in Belarus you have a very, a very hard dictatorship, a consolidated dictatorship. Uh, a model dictatorship, uh, let's say. So uh, often Ukrainians uh, make reproaches. Why uh, don't you do this or don't you that? Do, do, uh, don't you do that? Uh, in Belarus, you would not be able to make uh, an incumbent in the center of the capital. Simply, you would be all arrested within one night. Uh, in Belarus, you could not uh, use many, many, many ways the Ukrainians used. It's a different situation. But Ukraine is a powerful example. I am sure that the success of Ukraine uh, will uh, be maybe the last point that will convince the uh, every last Belarusian Silovik the Belarusian model is not uh, convenient anymore. Uh, the success of Ukraine will be the, also the key to the change in Belarus. We uh, look forward for the Ukrainian success and uh, uh, often if we are asked what the European Union can do for Belarus, uh, one of the uh, right answers is go on, continue support Ukraine. And the Ukrainian example will uh, lead Belarus to changes. May I, Kurt, have just a sh short follow-up to what Andrei mentioned? Uh, well, obviously, yeah, absolutely, that we cannot repeat any scenario, but we definitely can learn from one. And Ukraine is also a good starting point for us, because, for instance, this shows that it's not enough that we're, once we are over, once, for instance, negotiation happen and we, we, we are over this phase where people are just showing up for the streets and we do all this international pressure, that actually there are a lot of steps afterwards that should not be lost and we should start thinking about it already now. So, for instance, in Ukraine, what didn't work as well is this local elections where, unfortunately, where either frauded or bought or not that represented by the people who actually showed up for the streets. And that's what we want to avoid. We want these people show, who are showing up now that they are part, taking part further in all of these uh, consequent uh, political processes and that they go for the local elections. And that's why we also stress the importance of building these structures already now. Excellent. That's that's really helpful. And as, as, as we know, in, as an American citizen, uh, keeping people engaged even after you have a breakthrough, a democratic breakthrough, uh, both small D and big uh, and, and big D, is critical uh, to, 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 to consolidating. Our next question is from Bob McIntyre, uh, and it's, it, it, which, is, which is, will the change in US administration help Belarus? Um, I, I suppose many of you saw, or at least read about or heard uh, President Biden's speech in State Department yesterday, uh, where he was very vocal about democratic values and, and America's uh, you know, being a pillar of those pushing those forward. So uh, how do you think that might affect um, the situation in Belarus? Well, that's definitely will has, it already has positive effects because as you might know, they recently passed the Belarus, what's called the Belarus Act, which actually allowed and uh, sanctions the really huge sanctions and uh, allows for certain steps that will be very, uh, very tragic for the current government and very helpful for us. 
And the Biden as a president is a known Democrat and uh, who previously also shown a lot of support for our like the, the neighborhood countries is a really good sign for us. And uh, the ways the U.S. government currently shows their steps and this again, this Belarus Act is really a tremendous step forward and a tremendous sign of the support of uh, what's going on now and that they are this really this can change a little bit the against the dynamic of the resources and the powers. Andre, would you like to to opine on that question? What will have a direct influence on Belarus is the factor of, of oil prices, oil and gas prices. Uh, Belarus, um, the particularity of Belarusian situation that the Belarus is the may, maybe the only non-oil rich country which completely depends on the export of oil and oil products because the subvention that Lukashenko gets from Moscow are in uh, lower prices and oil and gas. So uh, as for Biden, me, I do not know what is uh, what what is what will be Biden's um, policy regarding oil and gas and uh, all these questions. Uh, for Belarus, the question of oil prices is uh, is key. We received another question. Uh, this one is from Timothy Wright Boycott, uh, and he says uh, Lukashenko is not immortal. How do his supporters in Siloviki view the future? Uh, is the system too fragile for succession to a new similar leader in the Soviet mold? Well, we would need to ask Siloviki, right, for <laughs> how they see their future. But uh, regarding the system, we should be aware that regardless if Lukashenko just accidentally chokes on something today, there are still dangers. It doesn't uh, automatically assume that we go directly to Minsk and everything and we win. Because obviously, first of all, and that is, there is always a danger and we are always aware that there is a possible pro-Russian scenario where the Kremlin sends or kind of push their candidate who will be shown as a democratic or pro-democratic leader, but then afterwards still backed by Russia. And this still can happen in the case when Lukashenko suddenly dies and uh, still the uh, the his whether he's the if the question is whether his surrounding is strong enough to maintain the regime in power if he suddenly dies it's really hard it will definitely be a very powerful trigger for us for society but uh, to prognose uh, really some definite changes is really hard at this point Thank you. Andre, would you like to, to, to give, give your take on that question? Lukashenko's regime is a personalistic regime, sultanistic regime. The theory says that such regimes often do not survive uh, their founder, their leader. And I uh, think that the most probable, uh, with most probability, after um, Lukashenko's disappearance or physical uh, disappearance or uh, physical decline, uh, the regime will change. This uh, kind of regime is too energy consuming to be rational. And few people uh, in Belarus, even in power structures, are so interested in preserving such uh, energy cons consuming and such an in inefficient system. The Belarusian system is very inefficient. Belarus has already become one of the poorest countries in Europe, despite all these big uh, Russian subvention, subventions, or, uh, thanks to the, these uh, Russian subventions. On the other hand, uh, on the other hand, um, what we uh, observe what we saw during last year's uh, year events, the Belarusian regime has transformed itself, has uh, has more and more uh, semi semi fascist features. What started as a soft authoritarian regime now now seems to be a semi fascist uh, regime. Uh, will it 
will this system, will uh, this elite uh, give birth to another uh, dictatorial leader? We cannot exclude it. We cannot exclude it. But uh, still, uh, in my opinion, uh, the most probable development is uh, like with Franco and Spain, Salazar and Portugal. That uh, after the uh, after them, we will have democracy. May I abuse uh, my uh, position just briefly and uh, on the topic? Uh, I read uh, uh, time and again in Belarusian language, uh, Russian language sources uh, that uh, the, the regime nowadays is modeling itself on the Venezuelan scenario where actually such a transition happened and where the state collapsed, but the Siloviki, the military and the security forces are carrying on uh, irrespectively. What do you think uh, about such comments co comparing Belarus to Venezuela and given that uh, during the last uh, months uh, 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 the regime changed all the regional governors with former generals of the army or of the security forces? Venezuela, uh, Venezuela type development. Uh, the difference is that Venezuela has its own oil and own oil incomes, while Belarus has no own oil. And Lukashenko depends totally of Moscow support. The first, uh, first big, uh, big uh, difference. The second difference is the uh, past. In Latin American countries, public public opinion has some deep psychological traumas of former dictatorships sponsored by the United States, and this relationship between Latin American countries and the United States is a difficult one, often difficult one. And uh, the third thing is European Union. <laughs> Belarus is not in Central Asia. Belarus is not in Latin America. Belarus is a neighbor of three successful European Union countries. Despite all the problems uh, with uh, internal co discussions and often some democracy problems in Poland, both Poland, Lithuania and Latvia are very, very successful, strong countries compared to Belarus. And no one can ignore it. How can you say that uh, your model is uh, successful if an average uh, medical worker, an average teacher in Belarus gets three times less than an average Polish medical worker or teacher. European Union success will be the most important factor in the future. There are no more uh, patriots and adepts of a strong European Union that we, the members of the Belarusian pro-democracy movement. Maybe the uh, Scottish people are also uh, uh, the, the same big adepts as we <laughs> heard of the European Union, but for other, for other, for other reasons. <laughs> Alexander, would you like to chime in on that question? Uh, well, I have just a few things to add that oh, I think it's needless to say that it's an unacceptable scenario if it happens uh, and then we will do everything in our power that this does not go this way. But also, um, it should be noted that any type of military coup in Belarus is also highly unlikely scenario. Because obviously there are a couple of these uh, forces in power amid which the military itself has remained, ne uh, well, relatively neutral so far. There are obviously all these different forces as KGB and Omon and Gubopik, but they are because exactly because the military so far hasn't shown has been neutral and uh, there is no this absolutely um, unique uh, like leadership amid, amid those powers it will be very unlikely to envision any scenario where 
one of those uh, forces will try to rebuke the power. Hey, thank you. We had one other question uh, earlier by uh, by Mr. Uh, Bivowitz. Uh, he said, "How can um, okay? How can how can opinion be swayed from those loyal to Moscow, given that Moscow is supplying a vaccine to Belarus, whereas the EU, which has little obligation to do so, has has and for now has cannot supply Belarus with vaccine? How uh, what does what effect do you think that has in terms of public opinion?" in Belarus to the extent it's a factor at all? Well, first of all, we are actually working on trying to negotiate the deal with the help of UN that there will be actually extra vaccine uh, from the from the European side delivered to Belarus. And whether it happens, and whether, whether, regardless the way it goes, it will be a huge win for us and a huge loss for regime, because if they decline this, they only will make their position weaker because the people will know that the the government resigns them the access to the vaccination. Uh, and if they say yes, that will be wonderful. It will be a win-win for everyone. And also in terms of vaccine, you should know that because we are talking to the medical workers weekly and we have direct connection. And this vaccine ordered from Russia, it's, it's just not enough. The number, the amount of vaccine they ordered is hilarious it's 100 around 150,000 of doses which is just not enough for the population of 10 million people given that there has to be at least two shots given and then all the consequent factors uh andre do you want to chime in on that question regarding vaccines uh, vaccine has uh, vaccine became a uh, highly political question here and even if european union had uh, extra vaccines for Belarus. And even if Be the European Union uh, offered the Belarusian authority of these vaccines free of charge, I think that Minsk would refuse it. Uh, because uh, now Minsk has uh, more obligations to Moscow it had had before. And for Moscow, uh, the question of supplying vaccines to other countries is a question now of uh, not only of economic profits, but a question of political importance now for Putin's survival. So Belarus, uh, Belarus has not yet received anything from Moscow, that, uh, a very small uh, 10,000 10, doses, I think, so far. Uh, and we do not know whether uh, when these, uh, the, the new portion of vaccines arrives. It's not so good like uh, Russia today presents it. We have just received a question from Alan Shaw Krivos. Uh, I believe a lot of the protests have, have, have occurred in Minsk. I'm curious to, how know, how, to know how those outside of the city in other regions of the country might view the anti-Lukashenko movement. Do you have any idea on the sentiment elsewhere in the country? Well, in the beginning, the protest, and that was also very important to realize, the, the, the August-September protest took place nationwide. We had more than 30, I think the last, I might be a little bit wrong in the numbers, but at least 35 cities uh, countrywide took part, and the smallest in the regions, and you could see this across the media, where even the little towns and the villages, people were there, were protesting. Of course, as we moved towards like now, uh, all these last past months, regime also didn't lose their time. They make every single effort to stiffen the voice of people. And obviously, the smaller the place you live in, the easier it's to target you. And now the regional, we didn't lose region. We know that there are plenty of people in the regions who are our supporters, but who has to go a little bit underground now just to sustain the powers and not to be all burned out or to, to go in prison. And they cannot show up in the same way that people show up in Minsk. But that doesn't mean that these, the regions are not uh, supporting us. It's just the disbalance. It's easier for the government to target and to find those people in regions than it is in Minsk, even though obviously the measures in Minsk have been also very drastic recently. Thank you, Alexander. Andre, would you like to, to add to that answer about the nationwide scope and, and, and the footprint of opposition throughout the country? The important point is that Belarus is not split. Ukraine was split into West and East. 
and it was uh, very difficult to mend this split. While Belarus showed to be very united with all the uh, regional differences, uh, Belarus uh, was united in this uh, pro-democracy, pro-democracy movement. Very good for our future. It is very good for your future. Rick, do you have any additional questions? I have one in, in the hopper, but I would imagine you you probably have some too. No, no, that's I, I've had ample opportunity, so please do go ahead. Thank you. Um, well, I was just curious. I mean, since your, your revolution started uh, on August 9th, um, there, there was highly visible action in the post-Soviet space uh, with the initiation of war in Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, and in this case, you had had a, a peaceful democratic regime change in Armenia some years ago. And despite having a, a, a treaty, a defense treaty with Russia, uh, Putin sat that one out. Uh, and what made me think of this question was his, uh, Putin's disposition initially toward what was going on in Belarus. I'm curious from, from both of your perspectives, what lessons, if, an, if any at all, it may be completely inconsequential, what message did you all take from, from the way Russia is looking at, uh, at leverage and, and its leverage in the post-Soviet space when there is a regime, regime change in, in its periphery? The way I took that was that Russia wanted to send a message that this is what happens if you have regime change and I don't give permission. Uh, but I'm curious as to your takes and whether that had any ripple effect at all on civic mobilization, fear, any of the factors that uh, that weigh in in your in your correlation of forces in terms of resources to continue on in in, in pressing pressing to get the democracy you've been mobilized. Please go in ahead. My opinion, yeah. uh, in my yeah. opinion, Nagorno-Karabakh events uh, showed most of all that Russia is not almighty. Uh, in uh, our P Belarusian perception, this war showed that uh, the Russian arms are not the best arms. It uh, I, it uh, seemed that the Belarusian army also um, perceived it in this uh, way. Uh, the uh, uh, loss of Armenia in the Nagorno-Karabakh war uh, was uh, a loss for the Russian prestige, military, military prestige in this region. Uh, and but for the for all of the rest, that it's not the Belarusian case. That our case is very very different, and the change in Armenia also it uh, was very very different. It, uh, has no uh, nothing to do typologically with uh, what happens in uh, in Belarus. Uh, yeah, I have only two points to add, which I mentioned earlier, that first of all, that the people of Belarus are equivocal in their position that no, uh, no, like, imposing scenario from Russia will be accepted or tolerated, even by those who might not currently be actually our supporters. And secondly, it doesn't mean that we also, uh, because it's this question obviously comes every now and then, what is the relationship with Russia? And that's important to stress that we are also do not demonize, uh, demonize Russia, and then we are open further to any relationship that does not put our sovereignty in danger. That's pretty much it. Well, thank you both for that. Uh, I, I would like to turn the floor to Stephen Gethins, uh, but uh, thank you both for being so open and, and fielding so many questions and from our audience and from ourselves. Uh, it's been a great pleasure. Stephen, would you would you like to come in? Do you have questions of your own in your, in your 10 minutes? Yeah, I, <laughs> do you know, what? I've, I've, I found the um, the question that you put, Kurt, and there, there were so many good questions, but I think the most pertinent one, I don't know if anybody wants to add, is what can we do now? Because um, I'm, I'm going to hand over for any final thoughts or if there's, I'll ask each of the speakers and I'll give you a little moment to think about it. What's the one important thing that you would ask all of us watching and listening today to take away from this? Because 
what I take away from this is that um, Belarus doesn't just border three EU states. In fact, um, there are some people argue that the geographical heart of Europe sits in in Belarus. And I know that others others will argue that as well. But but what it tells me is that this is not somebody else's problem. This is our problem. And for those of us who are Europeans, this is a question of European solidarity as well. So I have to say that I found this informative, but also a good reminder for us all um, who consider ourselves European, that the borders of Europe and what we should care about with Europe do not begin and end in the European Union. And I say this as somebody who spent time in the, the Caucasus, I know a bit further away in Europe from you, but from one end of Europe to the geographical heart of Europe, it's been really nice to hear about this today. So before I I, I, I finish off, I'd, I'd like to hand over to some of the speakers. So tell me, and I'll go to you, Alexandra, first. What's the one thing you want us to remember when we take, when we, when we leave, when we switch our computers off today or go on to the next meeting? The democracy is something you, you shouldn't take for granted. And there are yeah. still few, some of us who have to fight for it. Good, really good answer. Thank you. Andre, is there anything? I would like to remind you that uh, we don't have in definite time here in Belarus that our struggle for democracy is also a race with time. That if a kind of Chinese type control is introduced here over yeah. the society, it would be much more difficult for us to overcome it. We are now in this moment, in this uh, window of opportunity for Belarus. And please help us not to miss this opportunity. Thank you. And I think that's really important. I have to say I'm really grateful um, to Kurt and Rick and, and Thomas and everybody else who's, who's helped bring this together today. Um, what struck me is that in our busy lives and with so much else going on on a day to day basis, things are easy to forget about sometimes. And it is such a profound, um, profoundly important time for, for Belarus. And I was struck actually, and I think Alexander, you talked about it, that, um, that Svetlana, the national leader, that Svetlana was um, a Chernobyl child who came to Ireland. Well, in this part of Scotland, we obviously had a lot of Chernobyl children who came from Belarus and, 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 and from Ukraine and who spent time and who enriched our community by coming and visiting us over the years since the Chernobyl disaster. So what it reminds us are those really close links that exist and continue to exist between Scotland, the rest of the UK, Ireland and these islands with Belarus as well. And just to touch upon um, a couple of the other points that were made. So much has been achieved so far. Um, we can't forget, and one thing I'd like us to all remember is to think about the price that the activists are paying each and every day. Now, I've been involved in politics and I've got friends in all different political parties and some who are political but not involved in political parties. We have to remember that there are people paying a heavy price for democracy and we need to value the debate and discussion that we can have and we should do so with respect and it's something that 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 we often forget that one of the values that i'm proud of in scotland and elsewhere in the uk is that we are debating and discussing really difficult issues that people feel very passionate about but are able to do so in an open and democratic manner something that alexandra um andre that that, that, that you and your friends are not able to do and I'm so grateful um, to you and your colleagues for the bravery that you've shown over the little while and, the, and all of the lessons that we can take from everything that you've done. So please take a message of solidarity from this meeting today. Please take a little message of solidarity from our little corner of Fife. And if we can remember something, um, this is something we should be interested in. Yes, it is a race against time. And finally, democracy is precious. So please, everybody else, remember how precious that democracy is. Stay active, stay involved, but stay respectable as well. And thanks to everybody who's taken the time. And I'll 
hand back to you, Kurt, or to, to, to Rick or Thomas if there's anything further. Thanks everybody, and thank, and especially thanks to everybody in Belarus. We so much respect for what you guys are um, putting yourselves through just now. Thank you. I'll just I'll just add that we did we did uh, one of our questioners just asked, are there any pages that we should follow? Anything that we we should follow to stay informed so we could show solidarity in the best way? If you have if you have any place you want to point us to to follow you follow you, please do while we still have everybody on the line. Well, you could start with subscribing to the Twitter of Svetlana Tikhanovskaya. I think this is the best source to begin with. OK, thank you. And the address of Nasha Niva is very simple, nn.by. Thank you very much. Well, Tomek, Rick, do you have anything to add before we close? Yeah, I mean, I would I would like uh, to thank the speaker, then I will turn to Rick. But, you, you know, I, I really would like you to remember this symbol, symbol of the heart, which became the symbol of the yes. peaceful uh, re 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 revolution in Belarus. That's important. That's not a face. That's a heart. That's compassion. That's democracy. That's looking out, uh, looking, uh, taking care of one another for a better future. Thank you a lot for making the time. And I turn to Rick. It's going to sound awfully repetitive, but it's still very much meant. Um, Andre, Alexandra, thank you very, very much for this time with us, but indeed for all that you are doing. And you are, I think you've made very, very clear, extremely important to your people, but you are much more important, I think, to a wider world as well. And in our small way, we'd like to think that we are with you and we're recognizing what, what you do. And please know that you have friends um, in many other places. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for this wonderful event and uh, for all these wonderful signs of solidarity. It means the world. Thank you. OK, and thank you all for, for your time. Thank you. Thank okay, you. We'll sign off. Bye. Thank you all for attending. Thank you. Thanks very much. All.